Great. So I'm a fourth year PhD candidate in TU Dublin, and my supervisors are Luca Longo and Boyan Boric. And I'll be presenting this uh, GPT assisted annotation of rhetorical and linguistic features for interpretable propaganda technique detection in news text. <laughs> right. Um, so I'll spend hopefully no more than a couple of minutes on motivation or in other words, preaching to the converted, and then I'll just get right into the data and features and annotation and experiments. Um, so, um, as we know, the social science literature shows us that mis- and disinformation and propaganda are a threat to society and uh, to the functioning of democracy it leads to an erosion of trust and in social institutions and political polarization and ultimately unrest. The research also shows that propaganda, propagandists exploit uh, people's vulnerabilities to cognitive and emotional biases and that those biases are difficult to overcome. Some of our current techniques, such as flagging and demoting content uh, to overcome uh, those um, biases or to overcome propaganda can sometimes result in a backfire effect. So in other words, the opposite effect of what we're trying to accomplish, um, especially if the reader is already entrenched in a particular belief. The social sciences also tell us that media literacy and critical thinking uh, are a necessary solution for propaganda susceptibility prevention and then experiments show that objective explanations can help consumers to think critically, and that if information consumers are exposed to those objective, nonpartisan explanations, then they can learn to identify propaganda on their own. So for the purposes of this project, the definition of propaganda, and there are many, and this is one which is fairly common is that it is any information which is intended to influence beliefs or modify behaviors in order to further an agenda, right? So these are the, the intention and the agenda. What makes it a little bit different from other mis- and disinformation uh, work is that the information does not need to be false, right? Rather, it uses rhetorical devices and logical fallacies uh, to achieve its aims and these so rhetorical devices and logical fallacies are embedded in certain linguistic characteristics. So we believe that one way of achieving those desired sort of objective explanations is by shifting the focus from what is being said to how it is being said. In other words, how language is used for the purpose of persuasion. And this has long been the purview of rhetoricians and linguists. And while there are some techniques in computational linguistics and NLP uh, to, um, to give us, to, for extracting like syntactic features and morphological features, there is no single computational procedure for extracting sort of rich rhetorical devices and linguistic characteristics um, specific to the language of persuasion. All right, so that's what we're going to be trying to extract. Um, so a quick overview of the system. So we have three phases. First, we turn to the literature on the language of persuasion to generate a novel feature set. We codify those features um, into a machine readable format. Um, and we then pay human annotators uh, to label a small subset of our data. Um, and then lastly, we use those human annotations to train GPT or fine-tune GPT to annotate the remaining data. Um, in a little bit more detail, right, we're, um, here are the three stages again. So there's the feature extraction. Um, we create the JSON files containing features, their values, descriptions, definitions, and examples, right? We prepare our data set. This is the PTC corpus, so the Propaganda Technique Classification Corpus. 
and I'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, we then have a UI, which we built specifically for this task, which has a couple of features which weren't available in off-the-shelf tools. Um, and then we have uh, the last phase. Um, right, so this the, the UI is deployed on AWS. The code is available on GitHub for anyone else to download and, and use. Um, and in the last stage, uh, we generate or we construct a small test set, and then we experiment with different training sets, prompting techniques and fine-tuning techniques. So um, specifically, we codify the features described in rhetorical style, the uses of language in persuasion by Jean Fanestock. Um, there are, we end up with 22 features. Um, each has between three and 14 values or properties. And then on the screen, what you have is an example of the feature subject choices, and it has the values humans, rhetorical participants, things, abstractions, concepts, slot fillers. So you can see how these are not necessarily things that the standard NLP techniques extract. Um, and then they're accompanied by descriptions and examples. Um, this is just from the paper. It's a list of all of the features and their properties. There are around 160 of them. Um, so then here's what it looks like in JSON. So we have a feature called aspect. Um, all the values associated with aspect, simple, perfect, progressive, perfect, progressive, and then the descriptions and definitions. Um, so we can see simple aspect is expressing a simple fact. Examples, rover eats bones, rover ate a bone. Um, right, and this is done for all of the features, all 160 um, data points. The data set is the Propaganda Technique Classification Corpus, and you can find the reference in the paper. Um, so there are 18 propaganda techniques, things like loaded language, doubt, exaggeration, appeal to fear, right? Um, and consists of 451 articles annotated at the sentence fragment level. So you can see in the top example, there's sort of offsets where the specific technique is being used. Um, because we're going to be utilizing this data set to compare it to the state of the art on interpretable technique detection, we're going to do what they did and uh, um, just remove those, the, the fragment level information um, and just leave, it, leave the labels at the sentence level. So this sentence has two labels exaggeration, minimization, and loaded language. Um, right, and there's a, a total of about 20,000 sentences altogether. This is the uh, screenshot from the UI. So what we have at the top is a parse tree of the sentence. Um, on the left, you have all of the features, um, word level, sentence level. Um, then we have in the middle, a GPT response. Um, below that, we have uh, the definitions. Um, and then on the right, you can, uh, can actually see what's already been annotated. Um, so we asked three annotators, three expert linguists, to annotate 350 sentences um, with these features. They can select multiple uh, values or properties for each feature. Um, the reason we wanted to have the parse tree is because they can now select different subtrees uh, to assign different values of a particular feature. So here um, we have um, verb, a verb phrase um, with a progressive aspect, but there's also another verb phrase in that sentence with a simple aspect. So they have the ability to um, select multiple elements in the sentence. So this UI comes with the ability to review, uh, make changes, get help, get resources. It's fairly comprehensive. So every time uh, an annotator selects a feature, GPT-4 is also prompted um, with the same uh, feature. 
And uh, this is an example prompt. Everything that's in italic is the sort of unique to each prompt. And then um, the sort of system part of the prompt is, you know, you are a rhetorician and linguist specializing in news text. Your task is to identify which, if any, of the following properties of, and then you put in the feature, are used in the example text, right, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then uh, it's asked to format the response in JSON. Okay, so um, once, right, we, re we repeat that prompting procedure for GPT 3.5 um, using two different temperature settings. Right, so the lower temperature setting, the more consistent it's going to be. That's by design from OpenAI. Um, and we now have data consisting of 350 sentences annotated by human experts, GPT-4, and two versions of GPT-3.5. The table on the left shows inter-annotator agreement for each of those. We use Krippendorf's alpha to measure human agreement, um, which is the leftmost column titled K. And as you can see, it's fairly low. Um, since Krippendorf doesn't allow multiple labels, we're also going to calculate a Jacquard score. So that sort of intersection. So if one annotator chose simple and another annotator chose progressive and simple, there's an overlap of simple, and that, that's, a, that's a partial agreement. So to calculate partial agreement, we take a Jacquard score. Um, and then we also measure exact agreement. So both all three annotators would have had to have assigned exactly the same values to a given feature. And we do that because it's more of an apples to apples comparison to GPT. So GPT is it's, it's one, it's a single model. It's not like three annotators, three different GPTs. It's a single model, exact same prompt each time. It's really just the consistency, the intra-GPT consistency that we're measuring in an exact sense. So to compare everything apples to apples, we use the exact agreement and then the GPT-4 and GPT-3.5. Um, and you can see on the right is the distribution um, among the features of the consistency uh, or agreement, if you like. Um, GPT-4, 3.5 at the two different temperature settings and humans. Um, it's sort of curious that humans are so low on that, um, but uh, the important thing to note here is that the agreement itself doesn't actually tell us anything about correctness or accuracy, right? So um, in order to measure that, we're going to need some ground truth labels. Um, so we construct a ground truth data set. Um, we do that by taking uh, 30 sentences from each feature where all three annotators agreed exactly. Right, so perfect agreement, um, 30 sentences each feature, so we have about 600 data points. We then manually inspect those 30 sentences, those 600 data points, and if there is, if, if I don't agree <laughs> with the correctness of the annotators, I relabel that data point. Um, so so it's, a, it's a painstaking manual process, but it, it actually generates a nice grand truth data set of 600 data points. We then use those same 600 data points to perform error analysis on the GPT responses. So GPT was prompted to provide an explanation of its answer, and we analyze those answers to see kind of what kinds of things it's getting wrong. And, and we come up with sort of five or six different error types. Right? So confounding is when GPT returns some property or value right, of a particular feature, but it's using a definition of another value in its explanation, right? And it's getting the answer wrong. Overgeneralizing is uh, this is actually the most common one, um, where GPT will return some property or value of a feature, um, not necessarily correctly, 
and it'll explain it in a way that's sort of broader than the definition that we've provided. So this is an example of one. Um, the sentence, once again, the media are blaming the messenger instead of dealing with Islamic violence. Are blaming is an example of the progressive aspect, right? But the GPT's response is simple, and the reason it gives is that it's the text uses a simple aspect to express facts. It's, it's, it's an expression, simple, <laughs> an expression of a simple fact, right? That's sort of broadly, yes, that's true, um, but it's not true in the context of grammar. And that happens a lot. Hallucinating is when it just kind of makes stuff up that wasn't there in the sentence in the first place. Uh, greedy answering is a, an interesting one. So we give it a list, and in the prompt, we say, you know, choose uh, any uh, element from the list, and if none exist, provide an empty list, right? But it doesn't like providing empty lists. <laughs> so uh, there's usually some answer, but it, which is incorrect. And then other errors, which we weren't able to sort of easily categorize, where it's just kind of just, just wrong. Um, so to fix, so right, so this gives us some ideas for improving the prompt. Um, and the easiest ones to improve are the confounding and greedy answering ones. And we can do that by, instead of providing the list and all the definitions in the prompt, we just prompt it one by one. So we prompt uh, GPT for each value separately, and we ask it for a yes or no answer. Right, then it can't, it can't make stuff up. We hope that helps. Right, so, um, and then, so we, we, we run those experiments, the prompt re-engineering, as well as some fine tuning um, to compare you know, the results. Um, for fine tuning, we do three things. First of all, uh, we generate a small but high quality data set to fine tune a single model. That's on the advice of OpenAI's documentation. Small but high quality data set is supposed to perform well. Um, we generate a medium size and a medium quality data set and train and fine tune a single model. Um, and then uh, a large but low quality data set. And this is uh, multiple models, one for each feature. Um, I can answer questions more specific to that if later on. If People are curious. So, um, so this shows the accuracy as calculated on our test set that we generated earlier. Um, in the H column are is the human accuracy, right? So these are uh, humans um, versus my evaluation of them, <laughs> right? So humans uh, are right about 83% of the time when they all agree, right? Once there's perfect agreement, then they're almost always right. Um, GPT in the first version of the prompt, prompts, 3.5 does very poorly. You can see there's only 0.11, so like 11% accuracy. Um, and then GPT-4 uh, on that initial version has an accuracy of about 56%. The re-engineering um, procedure improved accuracy on GPT 3.5, but funnily enough, four kind of remains similar, right? Still around the 50% mark. Um, and then the fine tuning basically increased the accuracy of 3.5 to be on par with four. Um, Right, and that's a model per feature. So we consider that our best model, not just because of the accuracy, but mainly because of the cost. So the original title of this paper had on a budget next to it. Um, so it cost, uh, it cost 10 times, literally 10 times less to train and use 3.5 than four. So that's, that's a big win. 
And then finally, uh, and this is not in the paper, is a little bonus because this was done after the paper was already completed. Um, these are, this is a heat map of correlations between the techniques, propaganda techniques from the PTC corpus. So name calling, uh, things like that. Um, and then our features, you can't see them here, that's really not the point, but the, the, just, just a subset of the features that we've um, extracted. And you can see that you know, while the correlations are small, there is a negative correlation between our features and sentences which are labeled as not propaganda. Right? So that's a really promising result even in the uh, case of very noisy data, right? We only have about 50% accuracy, um, but we're still getting really nice visible correlations. Um, and um, yeah, that's, that's it. <laughs> Thank you. Questions, please.